Amen. Good afternoon. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Thank you. Lovely. It's wonderful to see so many of you here today. Uh, again, huge shout out to all of our families, all of our college uh, students who are back, and also our, our youth and children who are joining us today. So it's just wonderful to have them here as well. Uh, today, uh, for our Christmas Sunday, uh, I want to just go right into it. Is that okay? Uh, let's go right into the Word. So let's take out our Bibles to Matthew chapter number 2. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter number 2, verses 13 to 18. If you would turn there with me. We've been in a series called Advent, Real Stories Told. But it's okay if you've missed the last few weeks. I believe uh, this message in particular will, uh, I think, speak for itself in this series. Let's go to Matthew chapter number 2, verses 13 to 18. If you would, could you stand with me? And we're going to read together in one voice, Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 to 18. Let's start together in verse 13. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child, and his mother during the night left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning. Rachel is weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. This is the word of the Lord. Man, you may be seated. I've titled this Christmas Sunday message, the final message for the series. It's a very unique title. Uh, the title is literally Danger, Get Out. If you came here for a nice, warm, fuzzy Christmas uh, sermon, I'm sorry, maybe next year. Um, it's, this is, I'll, I'll tell you, this is very unusual. I, I really don't usually... Uh, get these um, strong feelings of uh, conviction to this degree. Uh, in a lot of ways, our previous messages, even the way that the titles were presented, it was in the form of a question, like, are we there yet? Am I supposed to be here? A lot of introspection and a lot of reflection. But today, in particular, as I was praying for each of us and praying for the message today, I felt a great deal of urgency I felt a great deal of priority and uh, a nowness. Uh, so you may not be familiar, but in, uh, in the ancient Greek, which the New Testament is written in, uh, there are two words for uh, word, right? There is the logos, written word, and there is rhema, right? And that rhema word is, uh, is a word for a particular circumstance, a particular season, in a particular moment. A lot of times we make the mistake of making those uh, logos and rhema mutually exclusive, like they have nothing to do with each other. But I'm telling you here today, there are times where the logos word can become a rhema word. How many have ever known, like you could read a passage like 500 times, but the 501 time you read the passage, it's almost like it speaks to you in a personal and fresh way. It's almost like the words jump off the page and it's like highlighted for you. And today, I think, is one of those days where I feel a great deal of urgency for today's uh, message and weightiness. There's not many messages preached on Matthew chapter number 2, verses 13 uh, to 18 in general, especially not on Christmas when we have guests, <laughs> when we have uh, visitors. If there is any narrative in the Christmas story in the Gospels that challenges our notions, our preconceived notions that the Christmas story is just like hunky-dory, and it's just like rainbows and butterflies, and it's just like nice, you know, just angelic stuff, and everything's symmetrical, and everything just is, is beautiful, beautiful, or just like orchestra playing in the back, it would be this message and this passage that completely shatters that paradigm because in a way, there's no way to ease into this. 
sort of like Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 to 18, if you're really reading it and understanding what's going on, at the center of it, of course, there is Jesus, but at the center of it, there is this King Herod. And forgive me for this expression, it seems borderline, or not just borderline, it seems psychotic and just conniving and evil. What's happening here? If you don't know, the previous uh, portion of Matthew chapter number two, the Magi go to seek out Jesus, the newborn king. And Herod confers with the Magi and says, hey, Show me where the newborn Jesus is because he was saying, I want to go worship him. But really, he saw Jesus as a threat because Herod was an inc- incredibly insecure kind of leader. So he's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure to put an end to this. When the Magi hear from God and say, go back another way, Herod realizes this. He's outwitted and he doesn't just stop there. But what does he do? He escalates it. And he commands and he sends this uh, private corpse in a way uh, to literally end the life of infants, two-year-old baby boys in the entire vicinity of Bethlehem. Are you catching this here? This is crazy stuff here. I know sometimes we sanitize our Christmas stories, but this is, this is some corrupt, evil, and dark stuff that's happening here. To add a little bit more context, this Herod king, there's several Herods in the scripture. This is Herod the Great. He was well known for his uh, uh, incredible accomplishments in architecture. He was known for uh, building great buildings uh, recognized by architects, and he was savvy in politics. He was recognized as someone who was uh, savvy enough in his political uh, maneuvering to be in the great graces and in favor with the Roman Empire, which was the premier world power of that day. All at the same time, he could command and he could corral uh, the entire region of Judea under his politics. But there was a dark side to Herod, a really dark side. He was insecure, he was paranoid, and he was someone who was incredibly twisted and violent. Historians outside of even the biblical literature, the inspired scriptures, they record uh, literal historical accounts of Herod in his latter days. He killed his own sons, he killed his own wife, and if that doesn't speak to the kind of story and person that he is, I don't know what does. But in a way, this paints almost the perfect picture, perfect, horrible picture in a way, to know right off the bat that when we read Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 to 18, for someone of his character, for someone of his pedigree, so to speak, this would fall right in line. Someone who is insecure, someone who is not willing to back down but will only escalate, he goes forward and commands for the killing of newborn babies, pretty much the the most vulnerable people on earth. This may seem obvious to you, but here's the first point I want to give to you here today. The story of Christmas is Jesus entering into our world in danger and in need of rescue. It's in the context of Herod going after the lives of these infant children that we find our message today. Now, all of you may know this to a certain degree, but there are times and situations in life where it's good to sit back and to be patient and to think things through, to be introspective, to not be rash and hasty in our actions. But how many of you know that's not every moment because there are particular moments in life where you don't have the luxury of time to just sit back and be introspective. If you ever had a fire happen in your house or something catch fire in your house, you don't have the luxury to sit back and watch the fire and be like, okay, Let's think about this a little bit. You either have to get off your feet and you have to either put it out if, it's, if, it's, if you're able to put it out, or you have to get up and get out. And if we look at verse 13, read the first words. Let's look at verse 13, the first words that the Lord gives to Joseph through a dream. When, the, when they had gone, an angel of the Lord 
appear to Joseph in a dream and says, get up. He said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. The angel's first words to Joseph was, get up. Now, um, I did youth ministry for a long time, and one of my first uh, pastors that I worked with, uh, he was a funny guy, a um, great guy. Uh, he had this one thing. How many of you have, uh, have worked with teenagers or have teenage children here in this room? Okay. And a lot of you guys, right? And um, one thing about teenagers is they love sleep. And I, especially when we would go to camps and events, uh, what would happen is in the morning for, for morning wake-up time, this pastor would be like, you know, wake up. And what would all the kids do? They would be in bed and they would say, I'm awake. <laughs> this pastor had this one-liner that I'll never forget. I hated it because he would sometimes say it to me too when I worked with him. He said this. He said, up is a position, not a state of mind. Think about that. So for some of you, this will hit it hit maybe two hours later. Up is a position, not a state of mind. You see, I think oftentimes, as Christians, we find ourselves in this weird position where we make everything so cerebral and hypothetical, where it's like, I understand, I've heard this Bible story before, I know that already. It's like, I'm awake. But Christian living is less about saying that you're laying down and you're awake, it's more about getting up. You know what, my wife gets on me sometimes. She's here in this room somewhere, and I could feel her eyes on me. Uh, she gets on me sometimes because uh, she'll, uh, she'll be like, did you read my text? Did you, why aren't you responding? And I, and I look, I'm like, of course I responded. I look through them. Lo and behold, I responded in my mind. <laughs> Some of you, when I text you, I know you don't ignore me, but you respond in your mind, <laughs> and you don't text me back. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Don't, if, if you feel conviction here in this room, it's okay. Where was I? <laughs> what, was I what, what I'm saying here is that oftentimes there is a big giant gap between our, our orthodoxy, what we know, versus how we actually are, how we act. And we could deceive, self-deceive ourselves to think that we're, we're living in the path that God has for us in obedience, when in reality, we're just as obedient as people who are laying back and saying, I am awake. Up is a position, not a state of mind. You see how Joseph, it wasn't enough for Joseph just to hear the command, get up, and be like, okay, I'll start first thing in the morning. If you catch it, when the angel of the Lord says, get up, take your wife, your child, and, and get out of here. He acts right away. He did not wait till the morning. How many of you know that there are commands of God and there are promptings of the Holy Spirit that are time sensitive? And sometimes what we do is we put it off, we put it off, we put it off. But we need to hear this. Delayed obedience is synonymous with disobedience. There are things that we've been told, there are things and convictions that we have felt and we just push it back and say, I'll get around to it. But maybe here today, some of you need to hear this with a sense of urgency. There are things that God has given you. There are promptings that the Holy Spirit has put on you and convictions. And you're sitting on a conviction. But the Lord is trying to not get you to know something. He's trying to get you to move somewhere. And I want you to hear this. Because oftentimes we overly simplify things. And Christians who go to church, we're the most guilty of this. There are times in life where God, in a situation, he says, stay put. See what I can do. Stay put. See how I can fight your battle. See how I could make a way. But listen, there are also times where God provides a way and he says, you need to get out of here right now. You hear me? There's no, there's no like overly simple like one cookie cutter answer. There are times in life where God says, okay, you need to stay put. I'm going to show you my presence, my power. I'm going to come through for you. There are other times where God is literally being like, you need to get out of here. 
So why in this situation with Joseph and Mary and baby Jesus, why, why was it the right move? Because by all, like if we make the whole like pros and cons and feasibility study, there were actually a lot of dangers associated with Joseph essentially relegating him, his, himself and his family as fugitives. They would have to leave in the middle of the night and travel in a small group, which was very, very dangerous in the ancient world. They would subject themselves to the elements, right, around. And not only that, they would be in a foreign country where they're unfamiliar with everything. Where were they going to go? Where were they going to stay? There were so many unknowns, so many reasons to say, maybe this is not a great idea. So my question is this, why was it a great idea? I want to look at a couple of principles here. Number one, in this situation, God called them to get out. And it was the right thing to get, uh, get out because, number one, God gave the commandments. Some of you, you have like a knee-jerk reaction when you hear the word commandment in church because that's been weaponized and that's been told in like a very legalistic sense, like, you better come to church, you better stop doing that or you're gonna, it's going to get really hot soon, not the good kind of hot. But can I tell you, commandments by cre- the Creator God was never meant to be something that was suppressive or oppressive, but commandments are for your good and for your flourishing. Commandments aren't to suppress you, it's to protect you. The author of life itself has commandments and guidelines not to give you a hard time, but actually to say, hey, this is how you flourish, this is how you actually live. By not following my commands, you're actually choosing death, not life. That's the first thing. God gave the commandment. But secondly, God not only gave the commandment, God gave a direction. How many of us have ever received the commandment without direction? It's almost like if, if, you're, if, if anybody here teaches, it's almost like saying, hey, this is what you need to do. This is the answer. But all the students are like, how? I, I saw you do it. That, that's great. It's great that you know that. But how? God not only gives the command, he gives the direction. He says, you go to Egypt right now. You know why oftentimes we don't hear the directions of God? It's because we fail to be humble. That's the biggest hurdle. You know what humility looks like? Humility looks like this. Humility looks like an acknowledgement and saying, I might not be doing the right thing right now, or I might not be handling my life. I might, not be able, I, I might not be handling my situation in the best manner possible. Secondly, humility looks like this. Humility looks like maybe there is a better way, or maybe I should really start to take some advice instead of taking things into my own hands. Second principle is God gives a specified direction. The third one's underrated. This often flies under the radar. God not only provides the command, the direction, but he provides the resources. Uh, You've heard the Christmas story before, I'm sure. You've heard the gold, frankincense, and myrrh that the the magi bring. And if you think about it, I've always wondered, I'm like, what, what good is that for a baby? It's like going up to an infant and like giving him like, giving him or her like $300, three Benjamins in cash. Like, what is the infant going to do? But think about it. God orchestrated every detail of the story. Knowing that they would be fugitives, listen, there's no quick pay, there's no Zelle, there's no Amex, there's no MasterCard. How are they going to survive? The most portable currency of that time was what? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. God prepared the wise men to bring the gold, frankincense, and myrrh to the family of Jesus, to the parents of Jesus, so that when God told them go, it wasn't like, okay, how? But I've given you every resource, and he gave those resources through people. There may be a situation in your life here today where God's given you a command, a direction, and even the resources. And here's the thing. You know why sometimes we don't obey God and the reason why we don't get out of situations He calls us out of? It's not because God's not speaking to us. 
It's not because we can't understand the truth, but oftentimes we don't act in obedience and we fail to get out of situations we're called out of because we are actually running away from the truth. How many of you have ever had friends in your life, and maybe you're sitting here and be like, oh, I never had a friend like that. You might be this friend. You ever had a friend in your life where it's like you and all your other friends are like, "Uh uh-uh, this is a red flag, red flag, bad decision. She's not the right person for you. He's not the right person for you. Don't do that. Every, all the alarms are going off. But that person does not see it, not because they're lacking intelligence, but they don't want to see it. Ever run into that kind of situation? There are times we fail to see the truth of how a situation actually is, not because we're incapable, but because we are unwilling to see it. Let me give you some practical stuff. If there is unanimous agreement in all of your close confidant and friends and spiritual authorities and spiritual advisors that something is not right. Friends, that may be a clear sign. That may be a clear sign that this situation is not right and you need to get out. And thirdly, there are people and even resources available for you. And you have people telling you the same thing over and over again. If you need my help, reach out. There are all these resources. Reach out. This may be a clear conviction and sign for you to actually get out. Let me ask you a question here today. Because oftentimes, you know what we do when we hear things that we don't want to hear? We say things like, it's not that bad. Or we say things like, you know what, give it a day or two, it'll blow over. It's not as bad. Let me ask you a question. What if the situation is actually as bad as people have been telling you? What if time will not make the situation better, but will only exacerbate the situation? What if it's actually as bad as people are telling you? Can I tell you this? Truth many times comes in the form of something we do not want to hear. Of course, there are times where people say outlandish, outlandish, like not good stuff that we shouldn't listen to. But if we're really going to be people who follow the promptings and the leadership of the Holy Spirit, hear me, you need to be able to listen to things you don't want to hear because the very thing that you don't want to hear might be truth trying to enter into your heart to actually liberate you from a certain situation. You know, we make this great mistake as Christians, and I've made this mistake for many years. We think that the only way to display faith, the only way to be faithful before God is to hunker down, stay in a situation, and stand our grounds. See, I'm not moving till God shows up. And then we wonder, oh, where's God? Oh, how come he's not showing up? Can I tell you? There are other times where it's actually the opposite of faith to stand your ground and to just simply just wish for things to get better. Sometimes God has already spoken and said, you need to get out of here. You need to get out of this situation. God has given you a way out. Think about it this way. For baby Moses, Moses, you all know Moses, right? When he was first born, Pharaoh was trying to kill off the Hebrew boys. This mother with a newborn child puts him in this papyrus basket and sends him down the Nile River. Apostle Paul, when he was being persecuted, he's lowered through a basket. For the early Christians in Jerusalem, when the persecution thickens, They dispersed. They ran away. What if standing your ground isn't the only display of faith? What if sometimes you're actually prompted to go and it's an act of faith to go and to step out and to trust God? Let me me help you a little bit here. And I I want to list a few things and I want to get really practical here. For some of you, 
in life, you need this a little bit more spelled out. Number one, there are certain conversations that you are regularly getting into with people, maybe the same people, and this isn't just a disagreement, this isn't, this isn't just offensive, but there may be conversations that you engage in in an everyday basis or a regular basis, and these conversations aren't just disagreements, it's dehumanizing, it's toxic. You as a person of faith, you as a person of faith are given the provision and the direction to excuse yourself from the conversation. To say, with love, goodbye. I'm not going to entertain this. Some of us, how many of us have ever felt pressure to just engage in a conversation just because someone's talking to us? And this might be tough because this might be fam family members. But there are certain conversations that maybe have escalated to be dehumanizing and you need to excuse yourself from them. Secondly, and this is a tough one, this, this, is a, this might be a personal one. There are people in situations where the home has become a place marked by anger, violence, and abuse. This might not be your experience, but don't assume that it is not anyone else's experience. There are people who live in a house, not a home. A home is a place of security. A home is a place where you feel safe. But they don't have a home. They have just a house where they live. Hands that were meant to protect and to hold have become weaponized for abuse, violence, and not just physical violence, but even mental uh, violence. I need you to hear this from me as a pastor. God does not call you to stay in a situation like that. If you've never heard this before from a church, I want you to hear this very clearly on where I stand. The scripture does not require you to stay in that environment where there is abuse and violence. Seek wise counsel. Find out what resources are available. God is not making that person abuse you. Can I get an amen? Thirdly, there are work environments that are unsafe and toxic. This is tough too because sometimes we could feel trapped in a workplace because it's our means of living. In this world, people with power are fully capable of doing heinous things and abusing their authority, not using their authority to help others. But they abuse their authorities to make the workplace an unsafe place. As a person of faith, I want to talk straight to you. By the faith given to you by our Lord Jesus Christ, start brushing up your resume. Send applications elsewhere you are not called to stay there. Lastly, and this is not exhaustive, for some of us, this place where God's calling us to get out of, it's actually relationships. For some of us, it's friendships. For some of us, we've been so, we've gotten so used to our relational dynamics, and you know what we start to think? Oh, this is just how things are. This is normal. But can I tell you, there are times where everyone in your life is looking at you and saying, that's not normal. You're not meant to live like that. We make excuses and justifications. We borderline gaslight ourselves to say, like, oh, this is just how things are. I just need to tough it out. I'm going to tell you as a pastor who's taking the word today and saying to you here today, there are situations that you are calling normal that are not normal and that should not be tolerated. And this is tough because this hits home. These are relationships. This is, these might be friendships. And can I tell you, it is fully possible in the provision of the gospel to do this. It's possible to look at someone and say, I love you and goodbye. I'm gonna say that one more time to this side. I love you, not but, and goodbye. I'm not 
putting distance, I'm not putting boundaries because I don't love you. But these boundaries are necessary right now for the life flourishing and the protection of my own heart and my own soul. For some of us, this might come in the form of a really difficult conversation to look at someone you really care for and say, hey, I can't do this anymore. I can't engage in this any longer. And listen, this pertains to every age group here. I don't care if you're in grade school. I don't care if you're middle school, college, beyond. Sometimes we find ourselves in situations where we, we think this is normal. We think this is just how people are and we're just meant to tough it out. We're just meant to hunker, hunker down. You need to get out. And listen, there are times where it's not even that those people are bad people that you're associating with. And some people, it's friend groups that are really toxic and very, very detrimental to one another. You're a distraction to one another. You impede each other's growth. And for some of these cases, it's not just the fact that like, oh, they're bad people, but some people, how many of you know this? Some people, it's not that it's just you're, they're a bad person, but they're just bad together. Like you talk to them individually and they're like, they're fine. But there are times where people come together and they enable each other. They say things that are inappropriate and you maybe feel obligated to go along with it because it's, everybody's laughing, but you're not laughing inside. You are not obligated to stay in that kind of environment where you feel uncomfortable. You can excuse yourself and you could choose to put boundaries. Listen, People can put boundaries in different ways, amen? Put, people can put boundaries in a way that's passive aggressive. People can put boundaries in a way where it's like, I'll give you the cold shoulder, I won't talk to you. But as a Christian, you can put boundaries in a way that is loving and also self-respect to yourself. Where it says, I love you, but I'm gonna put some space here. I'll be praying for you. Like, not just as like a pat answer, but I'm gonna be praying for you. But I will no longer insert myself in this kind of toxic environment. You know what's so tough sometimes? We don't get out of situations because we're like intimidated. We don't know what life looks like apart from this. We become so normalized to, oh, it's supposed to be like this, or I can't imagine my life without this person. You know who can imagine your life without that person? Jesus. Because Jesus came that you may have life, and life more abundantly. Can I get an amen? He didn't come so that you could just simply settle and to say that this is okay. He came to give you freedom. He came to give, give liberation to you. You don't have to stay where you are being suffocated. Sometimes the fear of the unknown can be a big debilitating factor. Can I say this? The fear of unknown is not a, it, it's not a direction from God. God is not the author of fear. God is a God who's, who's a God of truth, amen? He's a God who's committed to truth. If you want to be set free today, if you want to look for a way out, you need to start listening for truth. Not be aversive to truth, but start listening for truth. Jesus says this in, in John chapter 8, verse 31 to 32. He says this, To the Jews who believed in Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching you are really my disciples, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. This truth might be difficult to hear. This truth, when you hear it, you're saying to yourself, this complicates things or this is scary. But can I tell you, the enemy works to isolate you and to make you feel like you have no way out. But the Lord always says you have a way out. I have come that you may have life and life more abundantly. For some of you here in this room, you don't leave because it's scary. Can I suggest something to you? You leaving sounds scary, but you know what sounds scarier? You staying. You staying where you are is more scarier than the prospect of actually leaving the situation and facing the backlash. Staying is actually more dangerous for you. You might be in a loving environment 
with loving relationships, parents, friends, and things like that. Praise God. I rejoice with you on that. Thank God you are in a loving environment. But can you hear me today? Not everyone is in that kind of environment. Do not assume your situation is relevant to everyone else's. Because you will come across people in your life who are in dangerous and toxic situations. You will come across people who are in danger, spiritually, physically, emotionally. Hear me. Please do not assume that faith for them has to look like them just being faithful and staying in their situation. Amen? Please don't assume that. Please don't assume that the only way to manifest faith is to just stay in a place that is killing, literally killing your soul and your body. Sometimes it requires faith to say. Sometimes it requires faith to get out of a situation. But you know what the great thing is? Sometimes God calls us to leave, but that leaving is not permanent. God will tell you when it's safe to return. Amen? So it's not all, all is lost. Sometimes God tells you to leave for a season. The friends that you maybe like are afraid of losing, the relationships you're afraid of losing, God may be telling you for a season, you need to distance yourself. Not, not in a cold shoulder, immature way, but you need, to, you need to get some distance. I'll tell you when it's safe to return because they need to grow too. They need some time away from you too. It's not just you. I know this isn't the warm, fuzzy Christmas message that maybe you were hoping for, but I'm talking to someone here in this room. I'm talking to someone here in this room who may be in the middle of a crisis, a dangerous situation, and I believe that even if this message is just for one person, I think this is my assignment from the Lord today. We make self-justifications to stay where we are, and you know what we tell ourselves? We have that inner rhetoric This is just life. This is just how it is. It doesn't have to be that way. There's a man by the name of Abraham in the scriptures. In Genesis chapter 12, he's known as the father of our faith. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, the first words to God, the first words from God to Abraham is what? In a way, I'll I'll give you my version first. Get out. Now I'm going to read the NIV. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. Your country, your people, your household, all three are very personal things, right? All three are very personal things. But I'm telling you here today, We cannot get to where God is calling us unless we are willing to say, I'm going to leave where I am currently. You cannot get to where God is calling you to be without leaving where you currently are. And for some of us, this requires a very difficult conversation. For some of us, I know it's the holidays, but for some of us, this requires a conversation where you look at someone you love and you really do. And you look at them and say, I love you, but I need to excuse myself from you. I, I, can't, I can't continue on in this banter and dialogue continually. For both of our sakes, I'm going to distance myself. I'm going to remove myself from this situation. Some of us are hoping to arrive where God has called us. And all of us in here, if I pass the mic around, you would say, I want to be where God has called me to be. But the reason why you're not where God wants you to be is because you haven't left where he has called you from. You cannot arrive where God has called you to be unless you're willing to leave where God has called you from. Some of you grew up in a culture, very collectivist, very uh, communal, um, This is very inherent in the Asian culture where sometimes you're called for the greater good of the community, you just have to take it in the chin. Just stay, stay put. You just have to take it. If I just stay silent, if I just stay quiet, everything will be okay. But if I speak up, then I'm going to ruin everything. 
we have to be willing to allow the gospel and the culture of the kingdom of God challenge our own cultures and the lies of our own cultures. Because friends, that aspect and that lie is nothing short of a lie from the pit of hell. For you to sit in a situation and to just say you're doing, you're like the, uh, the sacrificial lamb, there only needs to be one sacrificial lamb. It's, he's Jesus. He's done that already. You don't need to do his uh, job there. For you to say that you're just going to do violence to yourself and allow things to happen to you because as long as you stay quiet, nothing, I won't rock the boat. God's speaking to you here today. You need to get out. You need to get up and get out. John chapter 10, verses 10 to 11 says this, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Christmas is all about the good shepherd laying down his own life, not so that we could remain in bondage, but so that we could live in freedom and in the life that he's called us to live. Can you say amen to that? Let's bow our heads and our hearts. You can choose to remain seated or you could stand at this time. I, I don't mind today. But you might find yourself in a situation or as you're hearing this message, you might be even thinking of specific people that you know and you love so much and they're in a situation. They're in a situation where the Lord has called them out. The Lord has not called them to stay there, but they're remaining there for whatever reason. Whether it's fear, whether it's an inability to imagine their life a different way, it's just become so normalized. Sometimes people walk hurt and injured, and after a while it becomes a gate. It becomes something so normalized that they don't even realize that it's something that they carry with them. You might be that person today. You might be that person today. You might be in a situation where all of the people who love you, all the people who care for you have tried to warn you, have tried to tell you, don't stay there. There is a different way. There is a way out. I just want to invite us right now because I, I feel that this message, although you might not feel that strong conviction for yourself, there may be people even in your life that you know you. You've tried to reason with them. You've tried talking to them. There might be people, if you're a teacher, there might be people in your classroom. There might be coworkers if you're in the workplace. People that you know and just something seems off. And you've tried talking to them. They haven't listened. Maybe the Lord is calling you to pray for them right now with a genuine heart of an intercessor. But if there's somebody in this room, there's someone who's watching online even right now, where this message is for you, where the words are jumping off the page, it's not because of my skill as a preacher today, but it's because it's what the Holy Spirit has given to us, this rhema word for today. Where you feel trapped, like there is no way out, there is no other version of your life. Jesus sees a different version of your life other than the one that you're living right now. You don't have to stay there. I just want us in our own way right now before the worship team leads us, can we just begin to lay our hearts bare and to come before the Lord in our confessions, our prayers, and maybe for some of us, it's simply to just say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I need you. I can't do this. Let's make this a house of prayer right now. So Lord Jesus, I want to lift up my brothers and sisters here in this room. Father, Your word has power. You're a God of truth. Holy Spirit, you are the spirit of truth. 
when your people are in a web of lies, when your people are in bondage because they have believed so many things that are so untrue about them, about the situation, about their lives, there are so many things spoken over our lives on a daily basis, and we treat that as truth. But Lord, teach us today, show us today that there is a different way. Show us today that you are a God who makes a way where there is no way. You're a God who makes a path through the wilderness, through the deserts. God, show us and convict our hearts and our lives today that we may not stay here, but we would begin stepping. We would begin walking in the path of freedom that you have for us. Lead us, Holy Spirit, right now. Show us your ways, oh God. I just want to invite you to continue to reach out to the Lord and to continue to pray. The worship team is going to minister and sing this song over us. We're believing that God is a God who makes a way where there is no way. He is a God who makes a highway through the sea. He is a God who makes a, 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 a path through the desert and the wilderness. He is a God where He works where there is no resources. I want to invite you to continue to allow God to speak to you and God to minister to your heart today. As we close our time together, I want to invite us to stand at this time. I want to take this moment to pray over each of you. If, there, if you are in this room and this message was for you, this message was a message to you in a particular situation, I just want to ask with every eye closed and every head bowed, if you could just quietly just place a hand on your heart. I want to pray with you, for you. If you're standing here, and maybe this message wasn't directly relevant to you in your particular situation, but there were individuals, people, family members that immediately came to mind. With them in mind right now, when with the heart of an intercessor, can I just ask you to also place a hand on your hearts? And I want to pray for you and just pray over us today as we finish out our time together. Father, we thank you on this Christmas Sunday. You are the Savior of our lives, of our souls. Thank you, Lord, that we don't have to remain in bondage and in darkness. God, I want to pray over my friends here today, my brothers and sisters. Some of them are in situations where there is damage and violence being done to their souls. But you have called them out out of that darkness into your marvelous lights. Lord, I pray that you would empower them to live as free people, to live as sons and daughters of the Most High, to live under uh, the overflow of your affirmation and the empowerment that you give and the words that you speak over them, that you're a God of truth who speaks truth into their lives, that they don't have to stay in a web of lives in a toxic situation. For others of us, our hearts are breaking right now for people we know in our hearts and our lives. Lord, we take this moment to bring their, their names and their, their faces as they come to our minds. We bring them before you. Oh God, we are never going to be convincing enough. We are never going to be smooth enough with our words to convince people to freedom. It has to be you, God. It has to be your word. It has to be your truth illuminated by your Holy Spirit, convicted, Lord God, into the hearts of your people, your sons and daughters. May you do that work of conviction and set people free through us. Let us know today that maybe this word is for us. Let us know here today that maybe this word is for someone else through us. Show us and open our eyes today that we may live in obedience to the conviction and to respond to live as people freed by the gospel of Lord, your son, Jesus Christ. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God eternal the fellowship, empowerment, and the freedom that the Holy Spirit brings. Be over you, your family, your loved ones, both now and forevermore. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord.
Merry Christmas, everybody. Uh, if you want to talk after uh, the service, I'm here and available if you would like to speak. Otherwise, we have some refreshments on the side for us to mingle and share some fellowship together. Have a wonderful uh, day and have a wonderful week. I will see you tomorrow if you're coming. Thank you.